Hello everyone. Time for focusing on God's Word. And as I say that, I hope that all of us have time throughout the week to focus on God's Word. Other times, devotional times, personal times, uh, times where we just stop and say, hey, I need to look at God's Word. I, I hope that's something that we all do. And I want to encourage that. I, um, as I get started now today, um, I, um, a couple things I'm going to just comment. Uh, it, it's been an interesting day for me. I, I had a computer glitch, and therefore, this message may be a journey. Because I, um, I had to piece together things in a way that I normally don't use. And... Um, uh, I don't have notes. I can't print out my notes right now. I've got some cards to show. I've got things that I want to communicate. I'm excited about this series of messages. I'm really excited about the fact that this is a time where we as a church are going to look and see what do we believe. And we're going to investigate what do we believe from the Bible. And we're going to evaluate is this what we're following? Is this how we're, fo we're focusing our faith? And I think it's going to be a great time. But now as I just say that, um, I'm going to ask for prayer. Uh, I've got an aunt. She's 101 plus years old. I've got two aunts that are over 100. And it's a blessing. They're, they're wonderful ladies, wonderful Christian ladies. And they're ladies that have prayed for, for me faithfully for years. And uh, I found out this morning that one of my aunts, 101 she was moved uh, to live with her daughter, who is uh, a nurse uh, in North Carolina. She's moved from the area where I grew up, and she moved there back in April. That's the month when she turned 101, and um, she's gone on hospice, and I understand that it is a very quick turnaround for her. She went from being vibrant and very, very doing very, very well to a very quick turnaround and it doesn't sound as if she's going to um well we don't know maybe she'll live for a longer time yet but uh the word i got this morning was is that uh, she may not be living long so i do appreciate prayer for uh our family uh she um she was my uh my dad's one of my dad's older brother's sister and uh, as I said, 101 years old, loves the Lord, and just a blessing to many, many people. And uh, I, I mentioned that. Secondly, um, I may use this as an illustration, but uh, I, I had lunch today, an early lunch it was, uh, a missionary with navigators, uh, a man who was in the church where I pastored in East Peoria, I married he and his wife. I did their wedding ceremony back in 1997. And um, eight and a half years ago, they went full-time on staff with nav Navigators. And they are serving in uh, Maryland. And uh, I met with uh, he, him, and he's got, they've got two adopted boys, uh, boys that came from India, actually, really nice young men. And I uh, had lunch with one of the boys and the dad today, and they revealed to me that a young lady that uh, also grew up in our church, on staff with a, a ministry, a college ministry, she and her husband were, and her husband, back about a year ago, maybe a little less than a year ago, he decided to um, walk away from his faith. And he was on staff, been on staff for several years with a very vibrant Christian ministry. And uh, the way they put it, he's deconstructing. He's, he's basically tearing apart what he believes. And he's determined that he doesn't believe what he was taught to believe anymore. And uh, that's, that's just one of those things that, that I processed that for a while today. Actually driving back from where I met this man for lunch, I processed that. And... Um, uh, it's one of those things that we hear about more frequently than we desire. And why does that relate to what I'm saying? Why will that be an illustration? Because we're talking about what is it that we believe? What do we take from Scripture that we believe? And that's what we're discussing over these days. And uh, I'm excited about this series. Uh, there are many other things I could say actually right now because it's been an interesting day. But nonetheless, in fact, I'm doing this 
uh, probably six or seven hours later than I normally do. And uh, when I get done, I'm going to be ready to uh, get some sleep because it's, it's, it's later in the evening now. And, and uh, the computer glitch had a huge impact on, on my ability to get all this together. And therefore, um, here we are. And uh, maybe that's too much information. Maybe you're saying, hey, get, get to it. And, and I need to. I realize that. But, you know, I appreciate those that are watching. I know there are more people that are coming to church than used to. But yet, I know there are people that are watching, and, and I, I trust that this is an encouragement. I believe that we as a church should consistently have an online presence with our worship services. And I, I believe that uh, right now, this is the best way to do it. We may adjust that in future. But nonetheless, uh, it, it's good for us to have an online presence. And I want to pray. I always do that. I, you know, I took a long time in introducing all this today. I want to pray, ask God to bless our time together as I communicate this on video and you watch it, you'll watch it and, and all that. And I, I just want to ask for God's guidance and for God to use this in an effective fashion. I, I would love it if people would pass these videos along and tell others about them because it's important, I think, that we realize that uh, good Bible teaching, or I should say, <clears throat> Bible teaching in general, is vital. It's necessary. So, let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that it's a privilege that we have to be your children. It's an honor. It's a blessing. And we want to glorify you because you deserve the honor, the credit, the praise. You deserve every bit of worship that we can give you. You deserve our attention. As we look to your word, we want to be attentive to what it says to us tonight. And I pray that you'd use this message from Ephesians chapter 4 to encourage our faith, to strengthen our faith, to build us up in our relationship with Jesus Christ, to make us more effective as ambassadors, as servants, as ministers for you. Help us in this, Father. Help me to communicate clearly. Help me to do this in an effective fashion. And I pray that you would clear my mind of anything that would distract. Clear the minds of those that are watching and listening from anything that would distract. Give us the focus we need to see the truth in your word today. And lead us in this, Father, I pray. I love you. I thank you. I thank you for our staff. I thank you for our, our congregation. I thank you for the ministries we have. And I praise you, Father, because you deserve every bit of praise I can give. And I come to you pleading and asking, guide this time, use this time, help me be uh, effective. I'm going to talk about being effective in this message. You know that. Help me be effective today, Father. And I pray this in Jesus' precious and holy name. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, hey, I used that thought a while ago. I made that statement a little bit ago. A young man, I'm not sure exactly how old he would be. He's probably in the neighborhood of, of early 30s. Been on staff with a college ministry, an effective college ministry actually Campus Crusade crew, for a number of years, and he's decided he's going to deconstruct. He's going to walk away from what he believes. Why does that happen? What is the, the thing that drives that? More and more people are doing that. In my lunch meeting today, we were talking. I was talking with this man that's working with navigators, and he's saying he's seeing that so many people are disconnected from what they normally or what they used to believe. And we're finding that, and that's a, that's a challenge. I read this week that a high percentage of followers of Jesus Christ, people that claim to be followers of Christ, they say, yes, I am born again. They check that box. And they say they also believe there are other ways to heaven. And we know the Bible says that's absolutely untrue. And it's so important that we are able to review and renew our, our, our thoughts about our faith on a regular basis. We need to do that. We need to look carefully with the scriptures and say, okay, how does this teach me? What is this saying? And I, I, I got a card back, back here, you know, same thing I'm going to pick, put on the screen right now. Biblical truth is what leads to our belief system. And our belief system is what affects our behavior. 
And as followers of Jesus Christ, we need to realize that what we believe from God's Word, the basis of our faith, comes from Scripture. And that focuses in, that makes us focus in on, these are the things that I understand to be true. The Bible is true. And we're going to see that in, in a couple of weeks. I'm going to preach a message on the Scriptures. And that should affect the way we live our lives. And we're looking at Ephesians 4 today. And in Ephesians 4, we're seeing a section there that talks about how Christ has gifted the church. He's gifted the church with church leaders that, in fact, equip the body to do the work of the ministry. But I want us to see, what is the layout of Ephesians? Ephesians, six chapters long. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes. And as we look at Ephesians, it divides right smack in the middle. Ephesians 1 through 3. Basically, I don't know if this is going to be visible because it's not very big. I'll hold it close. Ephesians 1 through 3 talks about God's role. And it says, In Christ, you also, after believing, believing the message, I'm going to read it right here, believing the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and having also believed, you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise. That's God's role. He provided the message of truth. And it says, For by grace you are saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. For we are His creative work, His masterpieces. God's role. He reaches into our lives, and He gives us the transforming message of truth that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. The Holy Spirit comes, and, and we, we recognize this because the Spirit helps us. God's role. But our responsibility... And this comes from right before what I'm going to preach today, what I'm going to preach today in Ephesians 4. It says, Therefore I, Paul the Apostle wrote this, I urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received. That's our responsibility. Walk worthy of the call that God has placed upon our lives. He calls me his child. I must walk like a child of God. You are being renewed in the spirit of your minds. This comes after the passage I'm speaking on. You are, you are being renewed in the spirit of your minds. The Holy Spirit's renewing us, God's role. So therefore, put on the new self. That's our responsibility. We need to take what God gives us and, and say, I want to change my lifestyle. And it says, the one, the masterpiece created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of the truth. God's role is... He transforms us with the message of truth. Christ died on the cross of Calvary. The Holy Spirit comes in and literally invades our lives, indwells and invades our lives. And our responsibility is to take the Spirit and walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which we've been called. That's our responsibility. And that's the book of Ephesians. God's wealth, our walk. God's wealth, our walk. And a review from what we, we saw, applications we saw last week. We see that we should, oh, this here, this was the second one. Knowing and understanding biblical truth protects us from pagan persuasions. From those persuasions that might lead us astray. Knowing and understanding the truth, biblical truth, it protects us. And that's a revived view for us. We saw that last week. That's why we're studying God, the, the, the belief system. But we should make it a priority. This should be a priority for our lives. That we would understand the what and the why of our belief system. What is it that we believe from God's Word? And why is it important? Why do we believe this? Why is this something that we need to get focused into our minds? And I think that's important. Now today, as we look at Ephesians 4, verses 12 through 16, 11 through 16, yes, 11 through 16, I'm sorry, I, I said that wrong earlier, we look at 11 through 16, well, I want us to see first, before I read that passage, I want us to see, this is our key thought. This is emphasizing our central idea, and that's, it's essential, absolutely necessary that every follower of Christ would be equipped for effective service. Every follower of Christ. It's essential for every follower of Christ 
to be equipped for effective service. We all need to be equipped. That's something that God desires for us. His, his role, he saved us. He gives us the Holy Spirit. Our responsibility, walk in a manner worthy. Become equipped to be a disciple of Christ. We're going to talk more about discipleship next week. But as we look at this passage, we read Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 16. It says, And he, Jesus Christ, gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastor teachers for the sake of equipping the saints for the work of service in order to build up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature person, a mature man, a mature woman, to the measure of the stature that would belongs to the fullness of Christ. It says, as a result, we are no longer to be children, infants, tossed here and there, looking at this and thinking, oh, I like that, looking at that and saying, I want that, tossed here and there by every wind of doctrine, by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, expressing, speaking, talking about the truth in, in a spirit of love, we are to grow up, to become more and more like Christ, to grow up in all aspects into being like Christ, who is the head, even Jesus Christ, it says. From whom? From him, the whole body being fitted and held together by which every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part that causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. I'm going to say that in a different way in just a little while. I'm reading it from my, my New American Standard here. But I'm going to, I've got, got three key points and two applications. And one of the applications is going to match one of the points that we give. But we're looking, what do we believe and why do we believe it? And why, what, what's the key here? What's going on in this passage? Paul is telling us in this passage that gifted leaders... People like Pastor Blake, people like the teachers that, that lead Awana, the, the, the leaders that lead Awana, the teachers that teach youth group. Hopefully, you look at me as a gifted leader. I, I know, in fact, I know I've been gifted by God's Holy Spirit to do what I do. I could not do this if I were not gifted by His Spirit. That would not be possible. I couldn't do that. And I, I think we, we realize gifted leaders equip faithful followers by teaching biblical truth. That's the source of our belief system, the Bible. And gifted leaders equip, we look at what it means, faithful followers by teaching biblical truth. And I want us to realize that. I want us to understand that. What, what, what's the passage say? It says, and he, Christ, personally gifted some to be apostles. That's past. Some to be prophets, that's past. Some to be evangelists, that's past, present, and future. Some to be teaching pastors, that's now. Some to do this and to do that, it says they're gifted. And he does this to equip the saints, to equip faithful followers of Christ for the work of the ministry. That is to build up the body of Christ. Let me show you that. Then he, Christ, personally gifted some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be teaching pastors to equip the saints for the work of ministry, the effort of ministry, the task of ministry, that is, to build up the body of Christ. He gifted people to, give, to, to, to equip. Now, the whole concept of being gifted... I had a conversation today. Someone said, in fact, they joked with me, say, now, don't turn this conversation into a sermon. Well, I'll just say, I spoke with someone today that was asking me about how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. And as I say that, let's realize that, that, that gifted leaders, pastors, teachers, evangelists, those that are, 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 are following God's guidelines for their lives and God's call upon their lives, gifted it literally means that we are provided in a specific way by the Lord's Spirit. 
Gifted means provided in a specific way by the Lord's Spirit. Jesus Christ gave the gifts, were provided in a specific way by the Lord's Spirit in order to enable, enrich, and energize a person's ability to serve the Lord and edify, build up the church. Gifted leaders, guys like pastors, guys like, like Christian teachers in schools or in seminaries, in colleges, those that are leading Awana, they're gifted, they're gifted leaders. Uh, those that are elders, they're gifted leaders. Pastor Blake preached a message a couple weeks ago that talked about elder leadership. Gifted leaders, they are gifted. That means it's, it's provided in a specific way by the Lord, by the Lord's Spirit. The Holy Spirit came and he, he gave me a gift. I could not do this. I guarantee you, I would not do this if it weren't for the call, the call of God upon my life. And I believe God has given me a gift to be able to look in his word and, and understand how it is I break it down and help people understand it better. And that is all the, the, that's all about enabling, enriching, and energizing people in the church, faithful followers, energizing their ability to serve the Lord. And the giftedness also, it edifies, it builds up the body of Christ. And I think it's important we realize that. People are gifted to do that. And those that are gifted to do that, they should be doing that. If you feel you're gifted to be a leader in the church, a leader in any fashion, whether it be in children's ministries, in adult ministries, ladies' Bible studies, men's Bible studies, you need to be recognizing if that's a gift you have, God wants you to use it. We're going to see that at the end of this message today. Gifted means specifically provided by the Lord. I think this passage is showing this, that Jesus is, in fact, the one that, dis that, that tells the Spirit how to distribute the gifts. It's His Spirit that distributes the gifts. And those gifts enable, they, enich, or in, they, they enable, they enrich, they energize a faithful follower's ability. It, it pushes them along, it motivates them, it strengthens them, it, 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 it increases their capability in order to serve the Lord and do the things God's called them to do. And in that, they are edifying, they're building up the body of Christ. And, and, and gifted people do that, gifted leaders do that. But what's it mean that they're equipped? To equip someone literally means to prepare and make ready for a task. When I was in the military, I was given a whole, a whole set of equipment. I was given a rifle, a weapon as they called it. I was given a certain backpack that had various things that were to be used in, in various ways, in very specific ways. And that was the way in which the soldiers are equipped. And, and I think it's important we realize equipping is to prepare and make ready for a task. As a soldier, I was equipped in that way. As a seminary student, I was equipped. I was prepared by certain classes, by certain things that helped me understand what it is. In people, in, in jobs, people do. Sometimes jobs require a spiritual gifting. Some jobs require spiritual giving. If you're a follower of Christ, many times the job you do may be a ministry in a certain in a sense. It may not be looked at by others as a ministry, but you as a follower of Christ in the role you have, you have a ministry. And the, the job you do may be under the power of the Holy Spirit. You are prepared and able to do a task. Equipping also means to make something or someone useful and capable. The Holy Spirit equips us. We as God's leaders use the Holy Spirit to equip others to build into their lives. And we do this in order to make something or someone useful. That's what equipping is all about. That's what, that's what it means. But as we look at this, it, it's, it's to provide the necessary tools, the necessary teaching, and the necessary training. To provide the necessary tools, the necessary teaching, and the necessary training. And we need tools. We need God's Word. We need to understand God's Word. This is a tool. I have nothing to say without this. 
I have nothing to teach without this. This is a tool. And this equips me in a certain sense. And, and, and you know, we, 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 we equip by giving tools, giving methods. We equip by giving teaching, by teaching them, teaching them things that they need to know, teaching doctrine, teaching the truth, and then training them how to do that. That's equipping a person. And godly leaders, gifted leaders, are called by God to equip the church to do the work of the ministry. Every person who's a follower of Jesus Christ should be equipped with the tools, with teaching, and with training, all focused on God's Word. And there's that sense that equip. Now, what are the different things we use? What are the different methods? What are the different settings? Equipping is, it involves preaching and teaching, like I'm doing right now. Preaching and teaching. Equipping about, can involve one-to-one -one personal contact. There are several people. Last Saturday, I had a long meeting with, with someone that I've been discipling, and I love meeting with these individuals that I disciple. And at one-on-one -on -one personal contact, we talk about the scriptures. We talk about what God's doing in our lives. We pray. We consider what God's involved in doing in, in our hearts and lives. It can be in a group setting, maybe a small group, a growth group, a Bible study, Equipping can take place in casual conversations. I had a casual conversation with this missionary that I met with today. And it was a good time. And in a certain sense, he, he said, I, he was a man that I discipled years ago. I did his wife and his wedding uh, 24 years ago. And I, I did pre-marriage counseling with them. I taught that this man took moody classes that I taught. This man came to me in my office when I was his pastor and we would talk and we would consider things and we would do today. Our, our conversation was a casual conversation, but he stepped back at one point in time. He smiled. He looked at his son and he says, Nate, he says, Pastor Greg, he, Pastor Greg, years ago, we used to meet together and we'd talk and we'd talk about scripture. We'd talk about spiritual things. And he says, he helped to equip me so that I could be a navigator be involved in navigators. And equipping also involves intentional meetings. We set up meetings specifically. I need to talk to this person about this. I need to help a person with this particular thing. Pastor Blake and I, tomorrow, we're going to meet. We're going to talk about doing ministry here. And I want to just point out a disciple. That word disciple from the scriptures. A disciple, literally the word from the Greek language means a learner. A disciple is a learner, someone that is receiving the truth and being taught and learning and saying, I understand doctrine, I understand what we believe, I understand why I believe it. And Paul says here that godly gifted leaders, they equip faithful followers of Christ to do the work of the ministry. And all of us that are followers of Christ were called to serve. We're called to be ministers. We're called to be ambassadors. And as we look at this, we conclude this first point, this idea, gifted leaders equip faithful followers of Christ by teaching them the Bible. We want to understand, teaching biblical truth. Why is it biblical truth? Why do we look at it that way? What is the key thought there? 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture from Genesis to Revelation, all scripture, every verse, every word is inspired by God. And since it's inspired by God, it's breathed out by God, it is spoken by God, it is expressed by God. It's like God is speaking to us through the pens of Paul and Peter and David in the Old Testament, and Moses. It's speaking to us, and it's profitable. It says four things. For teaching, that's what I'm doing now. It's profitable for rebuking. If somebody does something that is not necessarily in line with God's Word, we see that, and we go to that person and say, hey, have you thought about this? 
Are you willing to recognize that there's a problem that's existing here? Scriptures teach us in such a way that we can correct others. We can show them how do we we change that that habit that is a bad habit into something that needs to be that can be good. And it's scripture is profitable for training in righteousness. For that training we need tools, teaching, training. Training in righteousness so that the man or the woman of God may be complete and adequately equipped for every good work. That's so important. We teach God's word. We teach biblical truth because that is what's profitable. Profitable for teaching. Profitable for rebuking. Profitable for correcting and making things right. Profitable for training a person how to live and how to act and how to do what they're supposed to do. And that's important. We realize that. And equipping is one of the major ministries of the, of, of the body of Christ. It's a major ministry of pastors, teachers. It's a major ministry of you towards one another. And I think it's important. But now, in order for that to happen, we need to know God's Word. We need to know what we believe. We need to understand what we believe. And we need to be recognizing that we, we review it, we renew that, that, that thought on a regular basis. Why? Because we need to be fresh. One of my profs in seminary, I know this is a long time ago, and some people say hey, that was far long ago. Well, no, this is, this is relevant today. I went to him one time and I said, you know, prof, you come into class and you carry this stack of books and you pop it on the desk and you sit down and you talk to us. You never open a note. You never open anything. You open your Bible but you don't open anything else. Do you know this stuff? Have you learned these things so well that it just comes out automatically? And he looked at me, he says, shame on you. He says, I will never let my student drink from a pond that is stagnant. I want my students drinking from a fresh flowing pond of God's truth. And therefore, I recognize I must, I must give you from the pond of God's fresh truth and that's important and 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 you you need to be regularly looking at God's word studying and being fresh but now secondly as we look at this passage we see that being equipped being equipped for ministry includes establishing the essential truths that lead to unity unity of the faith is important and you know what right now our church, not our church specifically, but the church at large is so divided. And that troubles me. I could, I could speak much longer than I should speak on this, and I won't do that. I'm tempted, but I won't. But it troubles me that there's so much division out there. It troubles me that the essential truths of God's Word are not clear. Just this afternoon, I was listening for a few moments to Janet Parshall's radio program. And the man that was teaching is a man that has div diverted from what I believe is, is some correct doctrine. He was a guest on her program. He was answering questions. And he gave an answer to a question that I'd say, that doesn't fit, fit with script. That doesn't fit with scripture. There's division out there. There are too many opinions. There are too many viewpoints. There's not enough understanding of what are the essential truths that lead to unity. And the church is divided. And that's a troubling thing. And that's hard for a pastor as I look at that and realize that's not, that, that's not, that's not uh, helpful. That's not positive. And we get that from here, this here, this being equipped for ministry includes establishing the essential truths that lead to unity. We see in chapter 4, verses 12 through 14, Paul says, this is to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith. We all believe the same thing. We all understand the same things. We reach unity in the faith and of the knowledge of God's Son. We are centered on the fact that Christ is Lord and Savior. And he says, as a result, we are no longer to be children, no longer to be infants, tossed here and there by waves like we're on the ocean, and carried about by every wind of doctrine. The winds blow one direction, the wind blow the other direction. Do I believe this one day? Do I believe something else another day? 
And it says, and tossed about by the trickery of men. Men bring about false teaching. Women bring about false teaching too. There's false teaching that's out there. We can turn on the radio. We can turn on the TV. We can hear false teaching about God's Word. We can hear false statements that are just per permeating our society. And it says, and also, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. He says, we should no longer be children tossed here and there, that we're troubled by these things. Being equipped for ministry includes establishing the essential truths, establishing the essential truths that lead to unity. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, it says earlier in, in Ephesians 4. Now, as we look at this, the unity of the faith, what is that talking about? That means that we should have agreement in the things that are absolute. We should have agreement in the things that are absolute. These are truths that cannot be compromised. They're truths in God's Word. We cannot compromise them. We cannot say, well, I'm going to change that. I'll change the wording in, God's, in, God's, in the Bible and make it sound like it's something different. I can say, well, this type of immoral behavior is okay. No, it's not. Truths that cannot be compromised. Specific teaching that's related to the gospel. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Savior. Jesus Christ died as, a, as, 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 as my substitute. And when I think that, He died in my place. He was my substitute. He experienced the horrible pain and suffering of a, of a, of a humiliating death instead of me. Teaching specific things related to the gospel. You know, that's not pleasant. We, we can never give the gospel without talking about sin. We can't do that. We speak truth related to the gospel. Unity in the faith, that it, it, agreeing with the absolute, it's talking about biblical theology. Understanding that my beliefs come from the scriptures. And then finally, it's biblical instruction about God's will for my lifestyle. Biblical instruction that talk about God's will for my lifestyle. And, and that's unity in the faith. And we should agree, this is always wrong. This is always sin. This is always right. This is something the Bible doesn't necessarily describe as right or wrong. We can look at those things. Unity in the faith, though, is an agreement in the absolutes. Seeing these are essential truths. Things that can never be compromised. Things that are specifically taught with regard to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Things that relate to biblical theology. Things that are always, we see that this is true in the scriptures. It's in black and white. And those biblical instructions where Paul says, you know, do this with one another. Or he says, I exhort you therefore. Or as David says, hide God's word in your heart that you won't sin against him. Biblical instructions about God's will for our lifestyles. That's unity of the faith. But now I don't want us to understand this passage says that unity of the faith, it says until we all, we all reach unity in the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, and because of that, we are no longer going to be looking this way and looking that way and thinking, well, maybe this is okay, maybe that's okay, maybe this is what I should believe. No, we see a, a, a set of essential truths that are important. And once we grow to that understanding, we realize that unity in the faith is closely connected to maturity. We grow up into the image of Christ. We grow up to become more and more like Jesus. And that's what we're, we're, in, that's what we're entrusted to do by God's Word, by God's, God's Holy Spirit. And these things, the, the things that relate to, unit, to, to maturity, unity in the faith is closely connected to maturity. What's that all about? It says we are no longer being childish in our actions and attitudes. That we grow up and we are no longer childish in the actions that we carry out. We're no longer childish in the attitudes that we develop. That means we forgive and we forget. That means that we treat each other with respect. That means that we speak the truth in love and that we, 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 don't, we don't taint it, we don't twist it. It says not being distracted or deceived by the storms of life. 
We're t tossed about by every wind of doctrine. We're tossed about by the waves. And it describes all of that. And we're not being distracted or deceived by storms of life. And you know what? The last 20 months, the last year and a half plus, there have been many storms in this life. Storms because of COVID. Storms because of the economy. Storms because of political stuff, political strife. Storms because of what's happening in Afghanistan now. We should be praying for that. Are we distracted and deceived by those storms? Does that keep us, does that pull us away from God's word? Sometimes it does. And it says not being fooled by false doctrine or trendy theology. This idea of deconstructing our faith, that's trendy theology. Seeing that Jesus Christ is not the only way any longer. That's not true. That's false. And, and it's interesting because literally, unity in the faith, connected closely, closely connected in maturity, it means that we are firmly fixed on the foundation, Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, and the foundation of God's Word. We're firmly fixed on that. There is no other thing that develops our doctrine. There's no other idea that, that, that is the center of our faith. It's Jesus Christ and His Word. And that's, that's so important. And I think we realize that and we understand those things. But now the third point, and the third point I'm giving is going to become an application here in a little bit. Because we look at this passage and we see the last couple verses. In fact, let me read those first. It says, but speaking the truth in love, we're no longer tossed about, we're no longer torn, we're no longer distracted, we're no longer looking in directions saying, what is it that I should believe? No, we are speaking the truth in love. I speak the truth in love for you, in love for those that are listening. I care about those that hear. Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into Christ, into Him, who is the head, even Christ. From Him... From Christ, the whole body grows, fitted and held together. Christ holds us together through every supporting ligament. All of us are tied together as brothers and sisters in Christ. And as each one does his part, the body builds itself up in love. The body builds itself up in love. That's the passage. But what's the point? The point is that being equipped... Being equipped for ministry involves emphasizing truth. Truth is important, but it also involves expressing love. It also involves encouraging others. These are things God's called us to do, and it means that everyone is exercising their spiritual gifts. Every one of us should be exercising our spiritual gifts. Being equipped for ministry means emphasizing truth expressing love, encouraging others, and everyone is, ex is, is exercising their spiritual gifts. Now, as we look at that and consider, I want to point out these, these things and, and just say, em equipping requires an emphasis on the truth. I don't, have, I don't have anything to teach without God's Word, the truth of God's Word. And the truth of God's Word is, is very encouraging, but it's also sometimes very challenging. Sometimes the truth of God's Word hurts because it points out something to me where I'm doing something wrong. And I'm a sinner saved by grace. Equipping requires an emphasis on truth. Equipping is an act of love. We equip the saints. Why? Because we love Jesus Christ. He wants us to equip the saints. But equipping is also an act of love for the saints because we want people to be able to do the task that God's called them to do. Truth and love together are inseparable partners. They complement one another. They hold each other accountable in a certain sense. Truth without love becomes brutal. Love without truth becomes hypocritical. And I think it's important we understand that. I've heard many people say that before. Warren Wiersbe is one that's noted for saying that truth, that idea. Truth without love is brutal. 
love without truth is hypocritical. And truth and love are inseparable partners in our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the God, the man that came to earth, Philippians chapter 2, fully God, fully man, came to earth. He's a perfect blend of truth and love. The woman caught in adultery, John chapter 8. Jesus, he did not condemn her in front of the Pharisees. He told the Pharisees, if you're without sin, you can cast the first stone. And then he ministered to the woman, and he said, now go and sin no more. He pointed out sin in the lady's life, but he didn't give in to the Pharisees in being brutal to this woman. Jesus Christ understood that we were all sinners, and we needed his love. God demonstrated his own love toward us, and while we were sinners, Christ died for us. He recognized our sin, he acknowledged our sin, he loved us, and he died a brutal death, a cruel death, a horrible death. But yet, he says to us, you are my ambassadors. You now, you go out and, and share the good news with the world. And we recognize Christ, he points out sin, but he does it in love. And we see that. But now as we move toward the end of our message, we have some truths to apply. And that last thing that I said before, being equipped for ministry... It involves emphasizing truth. I cannot be equipped for ministry if I don't understand the truth of God's Word, if I don't recognize the importance of the truth of God's Word, if I don't recognize the things that are never to be compromised. It requires emphasizing truth. It requires expressing love. Expressing love. Christ said, God so or God said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him, would trust in him, would never perish but have everlasting life. And we express love, the love of Christ. We encourage others. That's, that's an application. It, it's, it's an instruction here in this passage, but it's an application. We should be encouraging others to carry out their spiritual gifts to fulfill the, the calling that they've been given. We should be encouraging others by saying thank you. We should be encouraging others by saying that, 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 that you know, we appreciate one another. And we should, everyone, be exercising our spiritual gifts. Why? Because when we exercise our spiritual gifts, then everyone is doing their part. Everyone is gifted by God to carry out a ministry. And if everyone would fulfill their spiritual gifts and carry out their ministries, you know what? Well, I'll say this, it'd be easier for me, but easier for you too. And equipping requires an emphasis on truth because truth without love can often lead, let me get this so I can read it too. I don't see, I don't have it on the back the way I do it often. You know, it requires them as truth. Equipping is an act of love. Truth without love can often lead to brutality and abusive behavior. Legalism, the Taliban, that's truth without any type of love. In fact, their truth is false truth, I know. They believe in a false, a false da God. They believe in a false set of standards. But then the legalistic aspects of, of, of some Christians were, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. They never say, well, you should be doing this, or you could be doing this. Truth without love can often lead to brutality and abusive behavior. You mean, mm. but true love without truth typically causes us to cling to our sin. And we need to understand that. And equipping says we need to call out sin. We need to emphasize love. We need to do all those things. And in truth and love are inseparable partners. And our Lord Jesus Christ was a perfect blend of truth and love. As we grow more and more, into the image of Christ. As we become more Christ-like, we become more able to speak truth with love. I'm more able to speak truth with love because I'm more and more developing into the image of Christ. And I'm not talking about myself there. I'm just saying making that as a, as a kind of a, 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 a corporate statement. We, I could say. 
and to address the problem and pain of sin by sharing the message of Christ's love. We have a world out there that is filled with sin. It's driven by sin. It's discouraging. It's disheartening. It's defeating. It's deceiving. All those D words. And we need to address the problem of sin. We address the problem of sin by saying, yes, sin is sin, but we do that by sharing the message of Christ's love. And that's an application. And that's important. But, you know, as we close, I want us to say one last thing. The unity of the faith is important. And I said I was before, I'm troubled by the amount of division within the church, the division in doctrine, the division in beliefs, the division in what to do and what not to do. And I want to say unity is vitally important. It really is. Unity is important, but never at the expense of accurate Bible, biblical truth. Unity should never be never be, be, be attained by dismissing the accuracy of, 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 God's, of God's word. Common ground, finding there are churches out there that would love to partner with us, but they'd also love to tear us down. There are churches, as I come here, as I drive here, as I ride my bike here, as I sometimes walk here to, to, to this church, to this building, this property, I go by churches that don't believe the gospel that we believe. And they may want to partner with us in various things around the community. I want us to realize common ground is always found by establishing the essential truths emphasized by God's word. And if we can't establish essential truths with other people that claim to be Christians, claim to be followers of Christ, we ought not to, to get involved with those ministries. We ought not get involved with what they're doing. We ought to say, no, wait a minute now. I'd rather do this with people from my own church or people that, that, that agree with me. Common ground is always found by establishing the essential truths that are emphasized by God's Word, and we should keep that in mind. We should never compromise those things that are absolutely true. And as I close this off today, I'm excited about the series of messages. Next week, I'm going to talk more explicitly about discipleship, and then we're going to start digging into doctrinal beliefs, biblical, biblical beliefs that are important for us to understand. But as I close today, I just want to emphasize once again, you know what? Nothing is possible in ministry without the gospel. And if you're watching this today, if you're listening today, if someone is passing this along to you today, I want you to realize that Jesus Christ died as our substitute. I am, I am here today as a follower of Jesus Christ because he paid the price for my sin. I'm forgiven of my sins, not because of what I've done, not because I'm a pastor, not because of any works that I can accomplish. I'm forgiven 100% by what Christ accomplished for me by dying on the cross and coming back from the dead. And that's the gospel. That's non-compromised. We can never twist that. We can never make that different. Every person alive today is a sinner who needs God's grace. There are many that we all know that have never trusted him. And the foundation of our belief system is the gospel that Christ is our substitute. He died on the cross for our sins. So you know what? I'd love it if you went out and told someone today. Find somebody, ask them if they've ever trusted Christ. Ask them if, if you know what? Do you know Jesus? Do you know him as your Lord and Savior? And you know what? Don't be embarrassed by asking that. You know, say it in a kind, loving way. But you know what? We need to reach the world because time is short. It really is. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. As I pray today, I pray for what's going on in Afghanistan. The pain, the suffering that's experienced, that people are experiencing there because of the regime of radical Islam, the Taliban. 
I pray for those that have been uh, hurt today. I pray for those families that have lost loved ones today. I pray for those that are stranded in Afghanistan because of what's going on right now. And I ask, Father, for those missionaries, for those Christians, for those followers of Christ, that you might keep them safe, that you might help them to have a message in a ministry. I pray for that. I pray today for our church. Help us to be an active church in this community. Help us to be preaching and teaching your word. Help us to be honoring you with the way we live our lives. Guide us, lead us, and direct us. I pray for anyone that's hurting right now. I pray for anyone that's struggling right now. You know the specifics, and I ask your blessing upon their lives. I pray, Father, that you would help us each and every day to see opportunities that are ours to share the good news, to live lives that are examples of what Christ means to us what Christ has done for us. And Father, help us to live, to walk according to the calling, to walk a life, that is, walk in a lifestyle that is worthy of the calling you've placed upon our lives. So help us, I pray. And I ask this all every bit in Jesus' wondrous, powerful name. And all said, amen. Thank you so much for listening and watching. Pray for us. I know that there's notes that come on as I send this out, or as you may have notes from the internet. I don't know if these notes are going to be exactly correct, because my notes are lost, actually. And, and there, there's a computer glitch. I hope to get it back tomorrow morning and be able to get it out. But you know what? I hope that this message was an encouragement. I hope it was a help. Thank you. Lord bless. And may God strengthen all of us. Thanks.